<laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Well, they say the first thing to go is your mind. I forgot my uh, my mic pack there. It's back in the office. I want you to turn to Revelation 16. Revelation 16. I don't know how I'm going to be able to do this. I, I got to talk with my hands. <laughs> I was reading uh, one of my favorite uh, comic strips. <laughs> is uh, Pickles. How many of you know Pickles? Earl and Opal. And, uh, oh, thank you. It was uh, over Valentine's Day. Yeah, yeah, no. Here, I'll, I'll do it. Thank you. Pause for station identification. <laughs> Valentine's Day, and uh, Earl comes up behind Opal. She's sitting in a chair, couch or chair or something there, and he comes up and leans me in front of her, in back of her, you know, and leans over the chair, and he said, I've written a poem for you for Valentine's Day. And she said, oh. He says, do you want to hear it? And she said, do I have a choice? <laughs> and he said, no. And so he read it to her. He said, roses are red, and I like spaghetti. Especially with meatballs, when it will be ready. When it will be ready, yeah. I thought that was funny. Valentine's Day, thinking about something red. Revelation 16. <laughs> Tell me you're just getting in now, maybe. <laughs> Most people who watch that say, are you kidding me? <laughs> That's a joke? No, it's not a joke. It's just a comic strip. You know, hey, it's just a comic strip. Then. We're going to talk about something very important today. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We know your word is truth, absolute truth. We know that you are the authority. You are sovereign. You are God all by yourself, no one else. You are God. And you revealed your truth to man. You revealed your truth, and we have it in our hands, the word of God. And we are praying this morning and asking this morning that you will bless us with understanding and knowledge in it. And even as Rod spoke about this morning, emotion in our hearts, the Spirit of God moving in our hearts, teaching and speaking this truth to us. We're asking for your blessing in it. We rely upon you. We trust in you, Lord God. And we ask this and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1947, a group of international atomic scientists met together. It was the same group led by Albert Einstein 
that worked on the Manhattan Project. And in 1947, they met together to discuss different things. You recall the Manhattan Project was the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, destroying and leveling everything in its wide path. We're so moved by that and so alarmed by that that they began to meet together and they said, we're going to meet every year. And they created or made what they call, or what they called, the Doomsday Clock. I don't know if you've uh, ever seen or heard of the Doomsday Clock. This is the first issue. They made a magazine. And every year they come out with a magazine. And every year on the cover of the magazine is the clock. The doomsday clock, it's been meeting since 47 up to the present time. They just met this last January. Of course, not Albert Einstein and those, but those who have come after them. These scientists and researchers. And this is the clock they made in 1947. I thought about bringing it up on the internet because then I could have had the color. It was orange. And these are the names, not all of them. There's some more down here that I couldn't get on this overhead. But these are the names of many of the atomic scientists that, that made the uh, atomic bomb that, that was dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so in 1947, they came together and they began to do this. And you see the clock right here. It is pointing up at midnight. And what they determined and what they were saying was that at midnight, at midnight, would be world, global catastrophe, cataclysm, destruction, death, globally. And they wanted to, to present this in this magazine and meeting together and, and warning the world through this clock, this doomsday clock, that this could happen. They met this year again, and the uh, clock on the cover of the magazine came out. Now over the years, since 47, the minute hand has fluctuated. Sometimes a little bit closer than what it was there, and other times it was uh, farther away, which was good in their opinion. This year, 2023, the doomsday clock was moved to 90 seconds before midnight. 90 seconds. They said, well, all that's going on in the world, the Ukraine war, the Ukrainian war with Russia, and the war there, the threat of nuclear, nuclear attacks, with China, with North Korea, shooting its missiles over Japan, China shooting its missiles over Taiwan, other places, and all threatening nuclear holocaust. And Iran bet on Israel's eradication, Israel's total destruction, annihilation, working, working, where the world stands blindly by for the nuclear bomb. They are so close. The United Nations and others told President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu just yesterday or the day before, it will be illegal for you to attack Iran to do that kind of stuff. It'll be illegal for you to do that. And he says, we have the right to protect 
our self against the nuclear uh, what they're doing over there, the configure, the, what they're doing, putting it together, he said they're only days away from en enriching, enriching the uranium for a nuclear bomb. And that's what they're going to do, even though they say they're not. It's that close to midnight. Holocaust. And this is what the president of the Atomic Research Society said, let me get it here. I want to quote it right, if I can find it. Ah, oh, here it is. When they met together, he said these words. We are closer to doomsday than we have ever been in the history of the world. He said, quote, the earth crept the closest it's ever been, listen, to Armageddon. He said those words. The closest it's ever been to Armageddon. Going back to what we were talking about, the tribulation period, we asked these questions and we answered them throughout several weeks, if not months. We said, when will the tribulation period begin? We looked through much of scripture and dis discovered or believed that it will happen when the church age is over with, when the church is taken out of the world. And the Holy Spirit in his present ministry is taken out. The tribulation will begin. We asked the question, how long will the tribulation period last? We went specifically to Daniel chapter 9, 24 through 27. With a prophecy that was given to Daniel about his people and his holy city, the temple area. And, of course, we included much other scripture in there. But how long will the tribulation period last? We determined seven years. The 70th week of years of Daniel's 77s. The 70th week. So then we asked a question last week. When will the tribulation period end? What event will bring this period to an end? And bring in the next age, the next period, which we know will be the kingdom. How will it end? And the first point that we made last week was very important, is that this tribulation period will have an end. It will end. And if you read the scripture carefully there in Mark 13, where we lit, we went to Mark 13. We find out that it is stated in there, Jesus speaking. He said, if, if those days were not cut and short, cut short by the Lord, all would die. There would be no survivors. None. So the end of the tribulation will be miraculous, supernatural. God's doing. Otherwise... The spiral would never quit until everyone was gone. If it was nuclear, can you imagine what would happen? With all that have nuclear ability now? So we looked at that. The tribulation period will have an end. So now we answer the question, what event will happen? And we got this far right here. This is what will happen. The second advent of Jesus Christ, also referred to as the second coming of Jesus Christ, also referred to as the return of Jesus Christ. And this is important to this present world. To Israel. To Jerusalem. That is the hottest spot in the world right now. Physically, 
bodily. Glorified body, of course, but physically, bodily, coming back again to this world. And we looked at those scriptures. We said every eye will see him. Revelation 1, 5 through 7, we looked at that. Every eye will see him. And you can see that could happen now. Satellites, television, your smartphones, everything. Every eye will see. That will happen. I was thinking about that this morning. I says, and we just sang about it. I believe that you will, you're coming again. We sang, always, always. I believe that you're coming in the clouds again. So then we asked the question, this is where we ended up last week. What will happen at Christ's return that will cause this tribulation period to come to an end? And it's going into the next age. The next age. What will happen? According to the word of God, which is absolutely true. Stuart was uh, kind of funny. He said, tell me, you know, last week, he said, I think I got three of the five. And he named off some. And he's partly right. First one. Armageddon. Armageddon. That's why we're in Revelation 16. Reading in verse 12 and on. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates. And its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. He's talking about east of Jerusalem, east of Israel. Northeast, actually. Then I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. Oh, yes, because frogs were a deity in Egypt and other places. They were a deity. How many remember watching, did you, did you watch ever the Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston? Long ago. Long ago. And who played Pharaoh? You Brenner played Pharaoh. And remember after the plague of the firstborn son and everybody died like that and then he let them go, but then he changed his mind and he's going to go get them and everything else. Unlike what the scripture teaches and stuff, he led his army to, to attack Israel and Israel crossed through the Sea of Reeds, true a name. The Sea of Reeds on dry land as God walled up the water and so Pharaoh and his chariots and his army went flooding after them, but then God brought the waters back over them and they all died. In the movie, Pharaoh, uh, Yul Brenner's back up there. He didn't go in there because, you know, he's one of the stars. He can't do that. You know, he can't die. So he's up there looking and watching and all that. Then he goes back to his palace and his dead son limp in his arms he takes to his God, one of his gods, a deity. And if you recall the story, you can go back and watch if you want. You call the story, lays him on the outstretched arms of his deity, and the deity is Hikat. At a head of a frog. Head of a frog. That's why one of the plagues that Moses procured at that time was frogs. Remember, frogs everywhere. Attacking the false gods of Egypt. So here we go. Then I saw three evil spirits, verse 13, look like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, which we already know is the devil, Satan. Out of the mouth of the beast, which we will see is the Antichrist. Out of the mouth of his false prophet, which we'll get into in chapter 13 someday. They are spirits of demons. Demonon. Greek word meaning evil, wicked spirits. Unclean spirits. Fallen angels from their first estate following Satan, the devil. 
They are the spirit demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them for battle on the great day of God Almighty. Don't think that evil spirits ruled by Satan do not influence and direct people of the world, especially leaders, especially presidents, kings, rulers, many times. Read Daniel chapter 10. Inserted in here is, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake, keep his clothes with him, so that he may go not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Then they gathered the kings, these demonic spirits, influencing these peoples of the world, the rulers. It says they gathered the kings together in the place that in the Hebrew is called Armageddon. Now when you talk about Armageddon today, you think of this whole idea of cataclysmic uh, chaos, catastrophe, global, the end of the world. But that is not quite what it means. It does in a way, but not in a sense, in the fullest sense. Let me share it with you. Armageddon occurs one time in the Bible, right here. It's the only time that word occurs. But the word, Hebrew word, is really har megiddo. That occurs 12 times, all in the Old Testament. Har megiddo. This is the Greek spelling of it. This is the Greek pronunciation of it. Armageddon. It's a place. It's a place. Mount Megiddo. That's what Har means, Mount Megiddo. Har Megiddo, Mount of Megiddo. Megiddo was a fortress city on Mount Carmel in Israel. The ruins are still there of this fortress city up on the mount, overlooking a vast, vast valley or plain. And that plain was called the Plains of Megiddo or the Valley of Megiddo. It is 27 miles long and 14 miles across this valley. On the other side is Mount Tabar. It was also referred to in your Bibles, if you read, is the Valley of Jezreel. Jezreel was on the southeast corner of the plains of Megiddo. There was a city there, city of Jezreel. And so they many times called it also the Valley of Jezreel, which is Hebrew. And the Greek name is Ezrael Elon. That's Greek. Same place as Jezreel. The plains of Megiddo. I want to show you, if I can find them, a little bit about that. I was going to have him bring it up on that, but I didn't do it. Plains of Megiddo. Here's a map of Israel, most of it. And I wrote uh, in there, Lake Hula, where the Jordan River actually comes from, feeds into the Sea of Galilee, and then comes down all the way here to the Dead Sea. By the way, Jordan means descending because the river descends to the lowest part in the world on land is the Dead Sea. And so it goes like that. This right here, all this light right here, here's Jezreel, here's Megiddo, and all of this valley is the plains of Megiddo. Or in the Greek, as he wrote there, Armageddon. Armageddon. I just thought I'd share, uh, I don't know if these are going to come out very good, a little bit about this. This is looking this way toward Mount Tabar 
from Megiddo. Can't see it too good, but that's, that's where it's at. You're looking across, you see that plain? Vast, 67 miles of a plain, 14 miles across, Mount, Mount Tabar and other mountains up there and Mount Gerizim down to the south here. Plains of Megiddo. Plains of Megiddo. Why is that important? Why is that important? Well, I'm glad you ask. Back to where we were at. Plains of Megiddo. I did a little research on this too. Napoleon Bonaparte. He was, he had the little man syndrome. Napoleon Bonaparte, standing up there after some battles that he's fought in Megiddo, said these words. The Valley of Megiddo is the greatest battlefield I have ever, ever seen. The greatest battlefield I have ever seen. The plains of Megiddo is a place famous in the Old Testament for one place in the history of Israel for war, destruction, and slaughter. War, destruction, and slaughter. The second coming of Jesus Christ, he will come again and he will touch down on the Mount of Olivet. And there will be this huge, huge war going on. And I want you to understand that the beginning of this war <clears throat> is to eradicate Israel and Jerusalem. That's what they're going to want to do. Lots of wars going on here. Lots going on in this valley. You can check these all out. Judges chapter 5 and 19, there's others too. But in Judges chapter 5 and 19, Deborah is singing a song about she and Barak and Barak how destroying the Canaanites in the valley or plains of Megiddo. Big war with the Canaanites. In Judges chapter 7, it's Gideon and the Mennonites from the east in the plains of Megiddo. In 2 Kings chapter 9, it is Jehu has been given the right to become king of Israel. And it is in the plains of Megiddo that he attacks the king of Israel and the king of Judah, Judea, who shouldn't have been there, but he was, Ahaziah. And he, at random, somebody shoots an arrow and it hits Ahaziah in the back between the shoulder blades. He's severely critically wounded and he flees, you read the story, to Megiddo. The fortress of Megiddo. And there he dies. In 2 Chronicles chapter 35, I want you to turn there. 2 Chronicles chapter 35. That is right after 1 Chronicles. Just before Ezra. <clears throat> Almost to the end of the book. 2 Chronicles 35. One of the last greatest, well, it was the last good king, greatest king, was Josiah of Judea. King Josiah, it will be his sons who will rule after him, but only for short stints, and they were all wicked. And then the, uh, everything will be destroyed. But King Josiah, I'm going to be reading at verse 20, 2 Chronicles 35. After all this, when Josiah had set the temple in order, all this was good and righteous, what he had done. Nico, king of Egypt, 
went up to fight at Carchemish. Notice where? On the Euphrates. Carchemish is way north of Israel, up by north of Damascus. Carchemish. Who's he going to fight? Well, he's going to fight with the Syrians. He's going to join with the Assyrians. What's going on there now? Well, it's just fighting. With the Assyrians against the Babylonians. He doesn't want the Babylonians to become the new world rulers because they will attack him and destroy him. He knows that. So he goes up to help the Assyrians who are in control to defeat the Babylonians. But Josiah doesn't seek the Lord on this. He doesn't want the Assyrians to win. He wants them to be defeated by the Babylonians. Because the Assyrians were cruel, heartless. They had already destroyed Israel to the north. Killed thousands and thousands of and they'd already attacked Judea. And it was only by the grace of God that they were able to hold and ward them off. So they don't want the Assyrians to win. So Josiah. It says in verse 20. Josiah marched out to meet Necho in battle. But Necho sent messages to him saying, What quarrel is there between you and me, O king of Judah? It is not you I'm attacking at this time, but the house in which I am at war with. God has told me to hurry. You're God. So stop opposing God. Stop opposing. Who is with me or he will destroy you. But Josiah, however, would not turn away from him, but he disguised himself to engage him in battle. And he would not listen to what Necho had said at God's command, but went to fight him where? In the plains of Megiddo. Plains of Megiddo. Archer shot King Josiah. He told his officers, take me away. I am badly wounded. So they took him out of his chariot, put him in other chariot, and had him brought to Jerusalem where he died. And he was buried in the tombs of his fathers, and all Judah and Jerusalem mourned for him. And Jeremiah, the prophet, he composed laments for Josiah. And to this day, the writer of this book says, all men and women singers commemorate Josiah and the laments. It became a tradition in Israel and are written in the laments. Now I want you to turn to Zechariah 12. Turn to Zechariah 12, two books back from Matthew. If you have trouble finding it. Two books back from the New Testament. Zechariah chapter 12. This brings us up to the present time of what God is doing and is going to do. We already looked at some of this. Chapter 12, verse 1. This is what the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Look at them. Watch them. The Lord who stretches out the heavens, who lays the foundations of the earth, who forms the spirit of man within him, declares, I am going to make Jerusalem a cup that sends all the surrounding peoples reeling. Judah will be besieged as well as Jerusalem on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her. But I will make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations, all who try to move. It will injure themselves. On that day I will strike every horse with panic and the rider with madness, declares the Lord. I will keep a watchful eye over the house of Judah, but I will blind all the horses of the nations. Then the leaders of Judah will say in their hearts, the people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty 
is near. On that day, I will make the leaders of Judah like a fire pot in a wood pile, like a flaming torch among sheaves. And they will consume right and left all the surrounding peoples, but Jerusalem will remain intact and in her place. And the Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first. Now listen to the time frame. Verse 9. On that day I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. How? Second coming of Christ. And Jesus returns to this earth. The battle so called of Armageddon. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will repent and turn to the Lord. Now call to the Lord. Please, Lord, come and help us. Come and save us. And he will. They will look on me. The one they have pierced. And they will mourn. As one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him, as one grieves his firstborn. Listen, on that day the weeping in Jerusalem will be great, like the weeping of Hadad Raman in the plains of Megiddo. The plains of Megiddo. The second coming of Jesus. The thing that will happen. Armageddon. Let me uh, just say one more thing. I won't get to three, four, and five, or two, three, four, and five. Armageddon, their planes of Miguel, this site, the epicenter of a final battle of this age before the second coming of Jesus Christ. You can write down all those scriptures when they will be fulfilled. All those things. I want you to understand, we didn't really get into this yet. I'm going to have to wait until next week. Doggone it. But I want you to understand this. As we call it, the Battle of Armageddon will be in, involved in extended it ain't going to just happen overnight. Boom, boom, boom. Be extended, escalating conflict, ending with the second coming of Jesus Christ, who destroys the Antichrist, his false prophet, and his armies who are gathered together there. And the target of this army and the Antichrist and all them at the beginning, the target as they've hoarded together, as we read in chapter 16, all the kings coming together in this place, their target is Jerusalem. The Jews. Ask yourself this question. What people is hated more in the world than the Jews? None. All those people groups around them want to destroy them, want to eradicate, want to annihilate them. This little teeny sliver of country. Why? 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 Because they're God's people. And who is it that is behind all of this destruction? Satan. The God of this world. Influencing leaders and rulers and stuff of these other countries to have that hatred to destroy them because Satan wants to be God. He wants to defeat God and rule. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Jesus will come back. They're there. The people are crying out. The Jews. Because they're coming to destroy all of them. Jerusalem. Everything. And Jesus will come back. And deliver them. Destroy the Antichrist, the false prophet, all of them. And other things will happen too, of which we will share next week. Now, 
Don't tell me that this isn't relevant for where we are now in history. My word. Watch, well, I don't know, I'd say watch the news, but the news is biased and the news is not always right. But watch what's going on in the world. A league is just joining with, with Russia, Turkey, Iran. <coughs> Things are going on, folks. We're getting close. And the thing that is so wonderful in our hearts is that we know or believe that the rapture of the church, the bride of Christ, happens before that period of the tribulation occurs. Before. And Jesus left it that way. It's called the imminent return of Christ. That means nothing has to happen prophetically now, although we see many of these birth pains and signs going on. But nothing has to happen prophetically. Jesus come back for his bride any moment. Today, before you go to bed tonight, when you get up in the morning, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, any time, he can come for his bride, for his church. We're going to talk more about that, not next week, but on down the road a little bit. I got it all planned out. It's so exciting. It's so exciting. To see these things happening and to believe the word of God and know exactly what's going to happen. Praise God for his word. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Oh, it's so clear. It's so great, Lord, your word that you revealed to us. We see all the, the nations of the world and all things that are going on around your chosen earthly people, Israel, happening just as you said, just as you said years and years and years and years ago. It's all coming to pass. And Lord, for those who cannot see it or do understand it, they're blind. Either by a self-will of blindness or blinded by the evil one, the God of this world. Lord God, thank you for your truth. Thank you for revealing it to us. And I pray, Lord God, that you give us real understanding, knowledge, wisdom in it. Because it brings our hearts to that place of praise and adoration to you. What a great God you are. What a great God you are. You are in control. Lord God, and we thank you for it. We give you praise through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, soon coming. Amen.